Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, an internal medicine and rheumatology specialist. Last time I spent the day with the flight paramedics up in the helicopter, I had such a good time. So back by popular demand, here I am again for another day. Today we're at the Toronto City Airport. The helicopter is ready to go and so are the flight paramedics, Chuck and Evan. Now we're just waiting for the first call of the day. So right now, since we have a bit of free time, the paramedics have to do a hover exit recertification every 12 months. So I'm going to come along and see what that's like. These guys are getting ready to jump out of a four ton machine hovering over the ground with whirling blades overhead. So much rides on the skill of the pilot and these guys thrive under the pressure. I love to hover. I am the hover lover. I can tell Chuck and Evan are dialed in. I feel a rush of adrenaline as we accelerate away from the ground with the door wide open. The wind rushes in. Everything was strapped down securely in advance, but I still feel nervous that something might fly out. Then suddenly, we get an unexpected call over the radio. Uh, guys, I have a seat and request uh, if we can have you check in. Uh, <laughs> anyway, if you can have the crew check. Yeah, they can do it. So, so in, we'll have to interrupt this little training exercise and come back to this later. Uh, so we've got a scene request uh, up north in sort of the cottage country area. Uh, so the details are female fell, fell out of a second story window, unsure of injuries, and nurses arriving on scene shortly. My mind races to all the potential injuries they could have. My first concern is for the brain and spinal cord. They could have a skull fracture, a brain bleed, or a spinal cord injury not to mention broken bones or lacerations. Right now, there's a nurse on their way who will be able to do a neurological exam. Then we'll find out how severe the injuries are. 20 minutes into the flight, we get an update. The nurse arrived on the scene and found the patient's injuries did not meet criteria for a helicopter evacuation. It sounds like she can get the care she needs locally. So we're changing gears again, literally pulling a 180 and heading back to do the hover exit. You're good to open the door. Got it, got it. Yep. The door's open. Door's locked. We're good. You're good to go. Marcus, okay. Yeah. Unsecured. Hey, yeah, medic one is... Calm off. Okay. Coming out of his seat. Medic. Is out. This technique of exiting the helicopter while it's hovering is critical for the paramedics to get to areas that are difficult to reach. Just imagine if there was a medical emergency at a remote cottage that can only be reached by jumping onto the dock. It's actually a really realistic scenario here in Ontario. Okay, Medic 1's getting on board. Check. Medic 2 is getting on board. Nicely done, guys. It's nice and easy when you're in a flat field. There's not like a dock that's floating and getting ripped up by the rotor wash or jumping onto a rock or something. All right, so now we're heading back to have some lunch and relax until the next call comes in. It actually seems similar to being on call in the hospital. You eat and rest when you can because you never know how busy the rest of the day is going to be. And that's our cue to get back in the air. At this point, we have limited information. All we know is that there's a patient in the emergency department with some kind of spinal cord injury who needs urgent surgery. Most of the time when people think of a spinal cord injury, they picture a trauma, like a car accident or diving into the shallow end of a pool. But there are actually lots of other causes to consider, like a tumor or an infection compressing the spinal cord. So at this point, we'll just have to wait and see. All right, so this is a priority one transfer of a patient, meaning life or limb. So an urgent transfer to downtown Toronto so this patient can get surgical intervention. 
When we arrive in the emergency department, we meet a man who is lying perfectly still in bed. You can tell he's in pain and that any movement is excruciating. The first priority is assessing the patient and getting information from his nurse. Chuck finds out that the patient presented today with severe back pain and loss of feeling in his left leg. He was rushed for imaging of his back, which showed a severely herniated disc in his lumbar spine, meaning the cushion between the bones of his spine has been pushed out into the spinal canal and it's compressing the nerves of his spinal cord. This is a medical emergency called cauda equina syndrome. Time is of the essence. The longer the nerves are compressed, the more likely he'll have irreversible damage. Next, Chuck calls the medical team and updates them with a plan. The, uh, like I said, they tried to control the pain. It was 10 out of 10 initially. They could try to control with hydromorph, unsuccessful. Meanwhile, Evan prepares the patient for transport, giving him some extra pain medications, knowing that even with their best efforts, sliding him onto their stretcher was going to be painful on his back. It's a quick turnaround, and now we're heading back to the helicopter. The patient remains amazingly still, and I can see his face grimacing with pain with each bump along the way. Evan prepares more medications, increasing his dose of ketamine and fentanyl to ease the pain. See how Evan is slipping the IV fluids into a pressure bag? That's because you can't hang the bag high enough in a helicopter to allow the fluids to run with gravity alone. So you need the extra pressure around the bag to get the fluids and medications into the patient. Unfortunately, the helicopter is so loud that it makes it almost impossible to ask how the patient's feeling. So they watch him carefully for signs of pain and distress. Fortunately, the medications seem to be helping. As we get closer to the city center, we get a call alerting us that multiple helicopters are trying to land on the same hospital. It's literally a helicopter traffic jam. We're going to uh, have our guys redirect to uh, city center. We'll take the truck up. Copy that. I'll uh, we'll have you to the island. The decision is made. We're going to land at the base, which is close by, and the patient will be driven the rest of the way in an ambulance. Okay, I've got to say, I'm actually a little bit happy that we have a little bit of a break at the base because it was a little bit more turbulence and so I started to feel a little bit nauseated. Evan mentioned a trick. He said that if you smell an alcohol swab, apparently it helps some people with nausea. And they offered me gravel, but I'm worried I'll get sleepy and like fall asleep on you guys. Uh, so I want to give this a try. Let's see. <laughs> it seems so weird to do. Someone just drove by in the car. <laughs> I wonder if I'm gonna put this in the video, it seems so weird. Wait, this is weird. I legitimately feel a lot better. Maybe it's the fresh air. Maybe it was the alcohol swab. Maybe it was placebo, but I'll take it. it <laughs> wow, it's amazing. It turns out there's research to support this hack. One study actually showed that sniffing alcohol swabs improves nausea scores more than a medication called ondansetron. I can't believe I've never heard of this until now. I love it. And that's it, another fantastic day. I want to give a huge thank you to Orange and the entire crew. It has been amazing, I've learned so much from them. So be sure to subscribe and that way, I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now.